This week's edition of NJBIA's Minding Your Business is brought to you in part by AT&T, helping family, friends, and neighbors connect in meaningful ways every day. From the first phone call 140 years ago to mobile video streaming today, AT&T innovates to improve lives. And by New Jersey Business Magazine, providing the critical information needs for New Jersey's business community for more than 65 years. Welcome to NJBI is Minding Your Business. I'm your host, Bob Considine. Well, to keep up with surging demands for using devices like this, AT&T is using innovative ways to enhance its network. Here to talk about its key investments for its customers and the community is AT&T Interim President, Joseph Divis. Thank you so much for being here, Joe. Hey, Bob. It's great to be here. Thank you. All right. You. So when we talk about AT&T's capital investments in mm -hmm. the state, what are we talking about here? We're talking significant investment. Uh, you know, in Washington and Trenton, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure. Yep. Well, we've been investing in infrastructure for basically as long as we've been operating as, as an entity in the state of New Jersey, which mm -hmm. is about 140 years. Wow. But for the, the, the most recent time period, uh, 2017 through 2020, AT&T invested $1.2 billion in our networks in New Jersey. So that's, you know, wireless investment. It was a lot of what we do. Uh, new cell sites, new small cells, fiber to connect them, the spectrum that we use to deliver, you mm -hmm. know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the airwaves um, that deliver the broadband uh, data and the voice uh, connectivity. And, and so within that, we have um, announced uh, new cell sites in 12 of the 21, or I'm sorry, 15 of the 21 counties in wow. the state and more than 1,100 individual enhancements to our network. So sometimes that's just doing upgrades on existing infrastructure that we have, um, or it's building new infrastructure. And, you know, because infrastructure is at the heart of, of our network and right. how we deliver for customers, no matter what the customer wants to do with their device. And, and as you said, you know, that device is, these devices are wonderful. I've been in the business for 26 years yeah. now. So when I started, it was analog voice. Very different than where we are now right. in the 5G world. Right. So th those devices are only as good as the network they're on. Mm -hmm. And now with, with all that those devices are capable of, with, with video, broadband, um, and voice, and other things that we do to keep connected, um, both you know, for entertainment individually, but also you know, mission critical things right. like public safety. That's what goes into why we invest in our network at such a, at such a clip. And, and we're gonna, you know, our intent is to continue to invest because customers are demanding it. And, yeah. and it's just, it's important for the state. Uh, and, and we think for the state's competitive edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, you, know, we, you mentioned public safety. I know mm -hmm. for, for a year and now, um, AT&T has been a, a sponsor of our show and thank you so much for all yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Uh, but you know, one of the spots we always run is a FirstNet ad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would love if you can better describe what that program is. Sure, sure. FirstNet is Public Safety's mobile broadband national network right. and platform. And it's really important um, to, as we talk about FirstNet, to say why is it so, what is, is distinct about FirstNet? One is we built a separate network core so that the traffic of our first responders goes through that core. Uses the infrastructure that we have in our network, mm -hmm. um, but it goes through that core. And, and that's a very important to distinguish from commercial yeah, traffic. Right. Got it. Next is there is this uh, band 14 swath of spectrum that is reserved for public safety so that when, when there's traffic, when there's too much traffic on the network and, and you can get congestion when there's too much, public safety just glides right through into that band 14. That's amazing technology. Though. And yeah, and it's automatic for our first responders, police, fire, mm -hmm. EMS. I'm wearing a first net yes, pin I saw that. with the three, mm -hmm. the three bars, which right. represents police, fire, and EMS. Right. And it's just so important. And it's not just voice. It is, it is data as well, because right. that's a very important part of um, how public safety can respond or does respond to, to emergencies. And we take this really as, as a special, uh, almost sacred mission to operate this network um, at really uh, for our public safety uh, and first responders. And we are also 
um, were contracted with the first net um, uh, first responder authority, right. and we are obligated to meet certain criteria and certain milestones, and we are evaluated right. on that by the first uh, first uh, first responder network authority, okay. it, which really distinguishes us and FirstNet from other uh, commercial offerings. You guys must really get um, excited about not excited, but just proud that you can basically save lives with this. I mean, this is yeah. this is what it's all about, yeah. right? Yeah. How many um, square miles does this thing cover? It's nationwide. It's the nationwide. network is nationwide. And it's not just the, it, it, it's the network, but it also is what else is, comes with, with FirstNet. Right. Uh, we have deployables um, that we have at the ready. If there are um, emergencies that require more bandwidth, mm -hmm for first responders, and it could be uh, what we call sell on wheels, um, <laughs> sell on wings, you know, so we have drones and right. things like that that, that can provide, uh, you know, service. Um, we have a blimp even, mm -hmm. and so that is at the ready, and, and we are obligated to, make, to provide that additional bandwidth in, in certain uh, metrics of, of time. We also have a, a whole um, response group that all they do is respond to situations mm -hmm. across the country and making sure that our, our delivery of the first net network is what the first responders need to do their job to save lives and save property. Great. So Joe, I know uh, whenever I, I hear anything in this, in this field w of which we're involved in, I'm always hearing about 5G, I'm always hearing about small cell. Mm -hmm. What is small cell and what are you, what is AT and T trying to achieve with it? Okay, uh, small cells are, are are really kind of that that next part of the network infrastructure that mm -hmm. we've been deploying for the last several years. So if you look at a, at, a, at a traditional wireless network, you have the macro cells, things on buildings, water tanks, large uh, antennas that cover you know can cover a couple blocks, can cover a couple miles, depending mm -hmm. on where you are. If you're in an urban area, if you're in a rural area. Right. So those are, can be considered the, um, the lanes of the highway. Okay. okay. We, have the, we have the spectrum that goes, that, that, um, that we're using. We have those macro cells as we call them. And now the small cells help us with the capacity mm -hmm. and kind of like the off ramps of the highway. Okay. The, the growth in data, the exponential growth in data has been happening really since the advent of the iPhone. Okay. And, and we're, we're, we're smartphone technology yeah. and, and other device technology really began to be part of our lives. Right. And so thinking about, you just think about any highway or any other infrastructure that we have and, you know, adding that extra traffic or capacity into that mm -hmm. in this time period, just say 730,000 percent. Right. So what we yes so our our our, our team of, of network engineers, cell technicians, and and other incredibly smart folks have done just wonderful work in managing that traffic. But and we've gotten more spectrum so that we can continue you know using those airways right. and and putting more data into those airways and, and pushing it through. But at the end of the day, we need those off ramps to continue to move that traffic okay. and make sure that it's at speed. Because as we, as we, you mentioned 5G, 5G brings a whole nother level of speed, capacity, uh, low latency, mm -hmm. and, and the possibilities of all sorts of things in the uh, IoT space, in the smart city space, in the uh, virtual reality space, and things like that. So we need to make sure that that traffic is moving and, and meet the customer's expectations for service quality and speed. So small cells are, are really, um, they're little mini cell sites. Mm -hmm. You know, an antenna and a, and a radio box on what we call street furniture, what right. we see in our everyday so, lives. So a smaller footprint, it sounds like. Very, sm yeah, much smaller footprint. Yeah. It's not meant to cover a large area. Mm -hmm. It's meant to, to add, particularly add capacity mm -hmm. so that that traffic moves. And, and, you know, it could be on street lights, utility poles, um, you know, uh, s uh, s traffic signals, things like that, and, and can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes mm -hmm. in, that, in that way. And, and it's just, they're, they're really very important to make sure we are continuing to deliver their quality of service. Right. And it also serves as a platform as we evolve the different flavors of 5G and the different bands of spectrum that we use to deliver that. So small cells in a, in a dense urban area, right. um, you know, and, and if we put the right spectrum with it, 
can deliver that ultra fast, uh, ultra low latency uh, 5G service. But that spectrum doesn't propagate very far, so you need the small cells close together. Okay. So that's what they. That's so. There's there's several layers of of um, service delivery that they that they uh, perform. To expand that service, um, uh, do you need something more legislatively to happen? Does AT and T? Well, we think that that it, it, there is legislation in Trenton that we're working on to essentially streamline the process that we work. We work with municipalities right. as we look at, at siting these and placing these. Uh, and, and the placement is based on the network needs and how the engineers monitor the network on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, and plan and make sure that we are staying at least ahead, you know, staying ahead of the curve right. on where the traffic is, but okay. making sure that, um, you know, that we continue to, to perform um, for our customers. So um, we are working on legislation that we, we think would streamline the process. So may, everybody kind of knows the rules of the road and, and really allow the investment that we, we, we want to do, not just AT&T, but all the, yeah. the wireless providers. Right. All that investment that we you know, want to bring to the state, to our communities, to enhance connectivity and enable that connectivity to um, be that quality of life enhancer okay. that we think it is and that, that, it, that, it, uh, that it can be. Right. So the, um, you know, we're trying to work with all sorts of, of the of stakeholders um, that are involved and look at something that balances, um, you know, how do we make sure we, we can continue that investment in a, in a timely manner but respect community sensibilities right. as well. So that's, you know, it, it, we, we think there's a needle to thread there yeah. that really does match up uh, everybody's interest so that um, you know local officials are engaged in the process mm -hmm. um, but that we all kind of know this is these are the rules of the road and and 30 some odd other states have passed similar legislation. I was just going to ask, so yeah. this would help competitively, competitively sure. for yes. New Jersey? Yeah. Yeah. Pennsylvania ahead. just did in, in, mm -hmm. in June um, and it was just enacted and uh, signed by, by, by the governor so we would be staying competitive with other states mm -hmm. and, and we do think that as, as I go back to all the talk about infrastructure in Washington and Trenton right. um, and what are we going to do with with you know what we don't know what's yet going to come out I, I think of that process but you know this is capital investment that is ready to be unleashed mm -hmm. and ready to help the state um, continue to move forward and be competitive in 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 the, the regional economy uh, in, in the national economy and even internationally because right. we want New Jersey to be a, dest a, a, a destination place for, for businesses, for residences. Right. And connectivity is a big part of that. All right. Uh, lastly, Joe, before you get going here, um, you know, I know as interim president of at and New Jersey, philanthropic initiatives are part of your bread and butter. Sure. What's been going on with the company lately? Well, we, we are always uh, very committed to the communities that we serve. Mm -hmm. And over the last eight years or so, um, we've been looking at uh, what we call at and Aspire, college success, high school success, um, work readiness, those types of things in that high school college space. Right. And we pivoted a little bit this year with our philanthropy looking at uh, the homework app and the digital divide. Right. And so we've been directing our philanthropy and a lot of the organizations that we have supported fit into that bucket as right. well. So if you, and it really runs the gamut across the state, whether it's, you know, HopeWorks in Camden, uh, Jobs for New Jersey graduates, um, uh, and power in Jersey City, organizations that are really at, you know, at the, the community level, um, working with young people, helping them you know, overcome barriers yeah. that, that there may be to their success yeah. and giving them that opportunity um, to move on, whether it's work or, or education or the trades or anything like that. So it, it's something we, we have, uh, have been and continue to be deeply committed. Um, we work with the New Newark Summer Youth Employment Program, um, the, uh, the Gateway Community Action Partnership, which is in Salem, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we just uh, we're down with People for People, which is not um, it's in, down in Gloucester County. Right. It's not uh, necessarily young people, but it's veterans right. and supporting you know the, their program to help veterans in, in, in acquiring some you know professional skills in their health and wellness. Right. So it, we really do try to be um, uh, 
part of the communities we're in across multiple areas of the state. Great stuff, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All Great right. to be here. This is Joseph Divis from AT&T, New Jersey, interim president. Thank you. We'll be back right after this. You're first. First to respond. First to put others' lives before your own. And in an emergency, you need a network that puts you first, that connects you to technology and each other, that's built with and for first responders. FirstNet, the only officially authorized wireless network for first responders. Because putting you first is our job. Welcome back to NJBIA's Money Your Business. I'm Bob Consolani. Well, it's October, which means New Jersey businesses are now paying an increased unemployment insurance tax when many believe they shouldn't have to. Here to talk about that situation and some potential good news is NJBI Vice President of Government Affairs, Chris Emholtz. Chris, thank you so much for coming back to the show. Thank you for having me, Bob. All right, so Chris, take us through this. Uh, New Jersey's Unemployment Trust Fund, obviously we knew it was gonna be in trouble from the pandemic, it was a big draw on it, and maybe businesses would be hit with an extra tax. But it really wasn't that simple, was it? No, it's not that simple. And, and, and you're 100% right that we were expecting something to happen. Mm. I mean, you had the awful, awful situation where over 2 million New Jerseyans filed for unemployment at some point over the past year and a half because of the pandemic. That's unheard of. Right. And obviously, that's going to draw down the fund, as you said. And so we were worried about that. And we heard estimates last year that the drawdown of that fund would lead to a billion-dollar tax increase. Wow this year on employers as payroll tax increase, a tax on jobs. Mm -hmm. Knowing that that was something we wanted to avoid or soften in some way, but also not knowing where that money would come from to soften it, we was like, you know what? The state doesn't have the general fund coffers to replenish the fund on their own, right. but what the state can do, when we actually did this in the Great Recession, mm -hmm. and Governor Murphy, the legislature passed it, Governor Murphy signed it um, back uh, uh, almost a year ago now, yeah is a bill that does two things. Number one, it said this billion dollar tax hike on jobs is going to be spread out over three years. So the estimate now is that it would be a $252 million tax hike this year, mm -hmm. and then around a $300 million tax hike for the next two years. Right. So when all still gets to that billion dollar level, but at least it softens, softens it spreads the, spreads the pain. Yeah. Um, it's pain, <laughs> it and it's pain nonetheless, no matter how you do it, because yeah. 252 is still a big tax increase, yeah, sure. but, but at least it's spread out. The other thing that the new law did is companies historically, the way the UI fund work is there's kind of, it's a, it's a chart a matrix and right. um, the rows are your experience rating and basically have you laid people off historically. Right. And so industries that kind of are roller coasters and have ups and downs, they're going to have higher experience ratings and pay more sure. into the fund because they have more workers that use the fund. Right. And then if you're a very stable workplace, you don't pay as high taxes, much, much better row. Mm -hmm. And then the columns are the overall health of the fund. So that is what we had to trigger a three column increase over these three years. But this law says we're not gonna actually make your row go down based upon this year's experience right. because government forced you to yeah, close. It wasn't government, their fault. Yeah, the it, wasn't, it wasn't the business's fault at all. Right. It's not like they made a decision right. that was a bad business uh, move and then that cost people jobs. Mm -hmm. No, they actually did what the government told them to do right. and they did it for public health, hopefully saving people mm -hmm. and making life easier for state and society as a whole. But that did cost jobs and that, did people, uh, that put people into the UI fund. Okay, so now we have that three-year uh, phase-in of this, of this $1 billion tax. But... Many states use federal um, recovery funds to help boost those, replenish the, uh, New Jersey hasn't, correct? That, yes, you are 100% correct. Um, we were extremely supportive, the business community, BIA, of the three year spread out and the hold harmless on the experience rating mm -hmm. because we didn't have any alternative to pay for it. Right. Since then, um, the state has received billions of dollars in CARES Act that they could use to replenish the UI fund and billions of dollars in American Rescue Plan funds that they could use to replenish the UI fund. Both of those, there's examples of states using CARES Act, states using American Rescue Plan. Mm -hmm. And I mean, historically, states have even used their own general fund coffers, and we did way back when, when right. we thought it was appropriate and we had the money right. to replenish UI to avoid this tax. Because again, if you think that businesses weren't necessarily the cause or the reason and, and, and you want to hold them harmless because they didn't do anything wrong, mm -hmm. well, why should they be paying an extra tax when when it, everybody had to. Yeah. And so um, most states in the nation have put some federal funds into this. 
and New Jersey remains a holdout and has not. Um, we, we don't understand the reasoning and, and we're now worried that we're into the first year's implementation mm -hmm. of this new tax increase. Um, we hope that something can be done in year one, but now this is where it gets more complicated. So to adjust the year one tax increase, the way the UI law works is right. there's supposed to be a snapshot of the health of the fund right. to determine what column you're in, mm -hmm. in this matrix. That snapshot occurs in March. Obviously, we're well it's past March. March. Oh, it, it oh, occurred last March right. for this year's column, right. and then it's going to occur next March for the next year's column. Mm -hmm. um, now, the snapshot says we should have gone three columns, but mm -hmm. we only went one because of that new law. If we, to, to adjust this year's tax increase, you would have to change the fact that you're supposed to base it on last March's snapshot. Right. Got that it. would require an act of the legislature and the governor signing the bill. We don't expect the legislature to come in until after their elections. Right. And and whether or not they want to do this or not, we just don't think it's feasible because the legislature and governor aren't aren't acting in time. Mm -hmm. What we do hope is that before next March, there could be some action by the legislature or governor. But you actually don't need legislative action. You can just have the governor choose to put a certain amount of money in and then the Joint Budget Oversight Committee, mm -hmm. because uh, part of the budget language in the budget that passed this June says that any spending of these federal relief dollars over $10 million has to be approved by the Joint Budget sure. Oversight Committee. It's a six member bipartisan, bicameral mm -hmm. group in the legislature. So they could actually approve it over the phone if the governor says, I want to meet, I want to do this. And so as long as that happens by March, right. then we could soften potentially the year two or the year three increase. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have not heard definitive word that's going to happen. Uh, we have not heard definitive word that's not going to happen. It's something that we're advocating for because, again, businesses shouldn't be left alone in, in taking care of the burden of unemployment. It should be something where the state has federal money to do it. They should step in and do it. Right. And, you know, we talk, you talk about the legislature. Throughout the end of the summer, we had Republicans and Democrats both urging the governor, please use this federal recovery money for this purpose. Yes. Um, and I, I think even Senator Declan O'Scanlan actually called for the legislature to reconvene from summer recess, which you know we probably didn't think was going to happen. Uh, but it do, does seem like the lawmakers' appetite is there for this to be addressed that way. But with the governor, what are we hearing? We're, we're not hearing much from the governor. Um, again, definitively bad or definitively good. It's mm -hmm. just uh, we haven't heard uh, much on this. I think in a press conference, the governor did say that he does not think this is the best ROI of right. the federal money. And that's that's an interesting debate because I think there, there's, there's return on investment. And if we had that lens with all the state spending we did, we'd be doing a lot of things very differently right. um, because there's also there's what's fair and there's right. protecting the vulnerable. And we know there's small businesses that don't deserve to have their taxes go up by potentially thousands of dollars yeah. over the next couple of years um, for something that they didn't do. Uh, they, they didn't do on their own. They did because government forced them to. And so there's what's fair, there's what's right, but it's also going to be economically stimulative in that if a business wants to hire somebody right. and now they're spending an extra ten dollars or $20,000 on unemployment insurance, then maybe they're not likely to hire that person. Right. Because as I said, this is a tax on job and that's what makes it especially harmful yeah. is it doesn't matter if the business lost money. It doesn't matter if the business had to lay people off. Mm -hmm. It's however many jobs, whatever that rate is, multiply them together. That's what you're paying. Mm -hmm. And so if you have more jobs, you pay more taxes. Right. And so it's a disincentive to hire people. Absolutely. And it's going to hurt the people that theoretically lost money but have jobs. They're going to be now paying more even though they're already hurting and they might have made less last year. Very interesting. So this year, October, it's a $252 million tax. Uh, I'll ask you to go with your gut here. After three years, do you think the state, our state businesses, will have to have paid $1 billion over those three years? Um, Put you on the spot. <laughs> Put me on the spot. I, I, I think my guess is I think there's a good chance that happens. Wow. Um, it's unfortunate, but I think with some of the statements about putting this money to better use does worry me. But I will say that that the governor's ROI statement, there is a point and there is a place where he could be right. And that if, I, I always like to say there's three pro-growth spending that I like to see. And mm -hmm. if the, the governor is putting money into infrastructure, mm -hmm. innovation, or workforce development, the business community, the state as a whole, the economy, workers are all benefiting. Those are three win-wins. Yep. And so 
if you were to tell me the four billion dollars left in in the American Rescue Plan funds are all going into, for example, building new college laboratories, mm -hmm. building roads and bridges, Got building it. new new K to twelve schools mm -hmm. and, and and old cities that maybe new new schools. Right. If you're telling me it's going to um, uh, support R and D efforts around the state, things like that, then I might say that four billion dollars. You know what? If you're going to do it for only those three things, right. that's great. And 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 yes, I wish you did the tax too, but I can get behind that, and you can explain to me why that's good ROI. Mm -hmm. If you're going to tell me it starts going for recurring spending, it's going for things that are not economically stimulative, it's going for things that actually are not helping any businesses, especially the ones that have been hurting, mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are in the industries that have been most devastated, then I can't get behind right. that. Fair enough. Uh, one of the things the governor has announced uh, that he is using federal funding for is uh, a return and earn incentive program uh, to help uh, both businesses who are struggling to hire and for workers who may be slow to get back to work. Chris, tell us about this. What is this uh, program? No, and it fits into exactly what I just talked about, Bob, mm -hmm. and I talked about workforce development and, and using money for that. This is exactly that. So we've we've been, and, and I know you've talked about it on your show before, it's the whole business community have been screaming about it, is there's a workforce crisis right yeah. now. Yeah. And and you don't have to go far, any main street, any, any fast food restaurant you're driving past on a highway, it's help wanted, help wanted, help yeah. wanted. And so, still, <laughs> still hasn't changed. And and I don't think, um, I don't think the federal government, state government, local governments have done enough to address this. Um, and we're very happy to see the business community as a whole. I think is happy to see this this initiative that the governor rolled out. Um, from what we hear, it's going to be two facets of it. Right. Number one, for employers, if you commit to on-the-job training for a new employee mm -hmm. that was collecting UI, so they had to have been laid off at some point because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you bring them on and then you commit to on-the-job training, which means you're paying that person right. while they're getting trained, mm -hmm. not sending them out and not getting paid. Mm -hmm. So on-the-job training, then the state will subsidize half of the person's wages okay. with while that training is going on. That's a great thing because we're yeah. supporting training, we're supporting rehiring people that have yeah. lost their job. And then, but that's on the employer incentive side. Mm -hmm. and, and there are caps there. My understanding is it's 10,000 per employee right. and, and then up to $40,000 overall 40. for the business. Mm -hmm. And it's only for small businesses, less than 100 okay. employees. Um, I would argue there's probably some right. businesses that have been hurting that mm -hmm. might be at the 101 and 110 and one, yeah. but they, they have to pick a number and focusing on small businesses when they have been hurt the most, it does make some sense. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of it is that incentive to get people to want to return to work because mm -hmm. the issue has not been that um, employers aren't trying to find people and employers aren't training people. Employers are desperately doing all they can. Right. We've heard many stories of, of wages being and, 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 and private companies doing bonuses, um, but the state's trying to step in here and help where it's a $500 employee bonus on top of the employer bonus to, to commit to the training and, and hire the person from unemployment. Okay. So put those two together, it's a win-win where you're helping employers, yeah. helping employees, you're hopefully addressing this workforce crisis. And I think the governor announced that it's a pilot program. Hopefully yeah. it's wildly successful and we could see more federal funds go to it. Do you know when it will start the program? Um, I don't know if I've heard that. Um, so should it have started sooner? No, good question, Bob. We are delighted that the governor is pursuing this and it's a great first step. We do wish things like this and other programs utilizing our federal funds. The federal funds are there yeah. to protect the people that were hurt because of the pandemic and stimulate the economy. And, and we think using that as quickly as possible in the most appropriate, responsible way possible is a good thing. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about the summer though. You know, there were so many, we had the summer tourism season. All those jobs yeah. could have been filled maybe a little earlier. No, that's an excellent point, and I can't tell you how many people that I've gone there, and, and I'm sure you've gone there, and we talked to, you were at the Jersey Shore, and you had to wait extra long at your yeah. favorite restaurant, or at the Jersey Shore, and you realize, oh, wait, I can't go for lunch to this place because mm -hmm. they're only open for dinner now, or, or you show up to a diner, and the diner's closed for breakfast. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> could we have done more to, to make people have a more enjoyable summer? I think so, mm -hmm. but I also think I, I want to make sure this money is responsibly used, so I don't want to rush it and have it not responsibly right. used you do have a couple of years to spend this money. And I think a, a point that we've made is to responsibly figure out how to make sure it gets the most bang for the buck. And, and to do that, if you need to take some time, but we also wanna make sure that the guys that are hurting are getting help when they need it. Very good. Well, we'll see how this pilot program rolls out. All right, Chris Emmerholtz, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, boss. All right, come back anytime. And thank you for joining us on NJBI's Mind Your Business. We'll see you next time.